Suppose we have a continuous variable, um, the target of which is 3500. This could be the temperature an oven should be in a material process, or it could be a number of dollars. It makes no difference what the units of measure are for the sake of this discussion, because statistically we handle the math exactly the same way. Um, so, so, so just imagine we have this thing out there, we have to target 3500 as reputable value from our customer. Our customer will typically give us some kind of a s specification limit in our process so that we can know the range of values that would be acceptable. So let's assume for the moment that our customer gives us a range of plus or minus 300. So if this target value of 3,500, we have a lower spec limit of 3,200 and an upper spec value of 3,800. That means the customer wants us to come in near the target, but is willing to accept a certain amount of variation that could be described by a normal distribution. So this is basically the curve the customer is looking for. The closer we are to the target, the better, but that's a slightly different discussion in quality engineering. So we're interested to know how often we actually can create product or um, have the process run or achieve the outcomes, whatever these numbers represent. Can we, in fact, meet that requirement? So we're basically setting up the 3200 and the 3800 as spec limits, and we're going to define as a defective anything that would fall outside of those limits. So we go out and measure the actual process that we do, and that's this blue curve. So, so suppose we go out and measure what our actual performance and find that on average, uh, we actually perform at 3250 with a standard deviation of 200. So we have a very wide curve centered at 3250. Uh, our average response is within the red bars we're after. Um, but as you can see, a lot of the curve is not. So if you ask yourself what the defect rate is and just evaluate the curve, you can see that there's a lot of data outside of the spec limits, particularly on the low side, below 3200. It's going to be a little bit above 3800, but it looks like our main defect problem is that we're producing goods below 3200. So we basically identify our defect ranges and we want to know the size of the curve. What's the probability of our process delivering in that range as we go? So this is your classic normal curve lookup. Uh, it's called a two-tail test because we're going to look at the probability below 3200 and add that to the probability above 3800. So there's actually two different probability calculations going on here. And that's going to be a pretty typical case when you're dealing with most statistical situations. The formula that matters here is the Z formula. The Z formula is X minus R bar divided by S. And this is how we convert the blue curve we're looking at with its own mean and standard deviation into a standard normal curve that will have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So we take the very first, the lower Z we refer to it as, what's the Z value associated with 3200? So what is the distance from the X bar to the lower spec limit? in terms of numbers of standard deviations. So it's uh, 3200 minus the 3250, that's the distance traveled, divided by 200 will compress it to a smaller standard deviation. The answer is negative one quarter. Uh, you could see that visually if you simply look. It's a difference of only 50 and S was 200. So you know it's going to be a quarter. But the negative matters. The negative is what tells you that the, um, the X that you're looking at is to the left of the mean, or the X bar you're looking at is to the right, however you want to view it, um, the arrow is pointing. It always helps if you draw the picture on these kinds of problems, because the direction of the arrow that I just drew told me in advance that the value was going to be negative. If I wanted to the upper Z, I'd do the same thing, only my arrow is going the other direction, so I expect it to be a positive number. My 3800 upper spec limit minus the X bar 3250 over 200 is an upper Z of 2.75. So negative 0.25 and positive 2.75 are the two Z values on my curve. I then look up the probabilities for each one, and realistically you're going to use Excel, but I wanted to make sure you can see how to use uh, the standard table that's in Appendix A3 in the textbook. Uh, it's also usually on the inside cover of uh, most statistics books because it is so commonly used. So you'll look up the Z table, um, and in the case of negative 0.25, we want to find that probability value in the table. So we're basically looking for the uh, negative 0.2 in the column to the left, that will give us the first significant digit. We then use the headings across the top to find the 0.05, which has to be added to that. And the intersection of that is the probability we're interested in, 0 0.4013. So about 40% probability the data will fall below that 3200 that we're after. 
Um, more often than not, though, we'll use Excel until we get that value quickly. We'll use the norms disk, the normal standard distribution function of Excel, where all you have to do is plug in the Z value, negative 0.25. Um, keep in mind that if you have a different version of Excel, uh, sometimes the norms dist function is spelled a little differently, norms.dist or norms, norms uh, dist. Um, make sure you're looking for the proper function when you're there. But the only parameter you give this function uh, is the Z value, and that gives us the 40.3%, and we would get the same answer if we looked it up in the table. We can then repeat that process for the upper Z. Um, only, so we're going to look up the Z value that we got 2.75 in the table um, and we look in the, the columns here and it's 2.7 and the top at 0 0.05 and we find a probability of 90.9970. Remember this is the integral from negative infinity up to our Z value. When we're dealing with an upper curve like this small red area here we actually want everything above that value not everything below it. So we have to remember to subtract that value from 1 um, as we go. So 1 minus the norms dist of 2.75 gives us the probability we get from 1 minus 0.9970, or rather 0.003. I also could have looked up to get the 0.003 instead of using the positive 2.75. Since I know I'm going to subtract it from 1 anyway, I could have also looked up the negative 2.75, and the value in the table there would have been 0.003. Um, so either way, I can look it up in a table and quite satisfactorily as I go. So that gives me the two probabilities that I want. I add them together and the area, combined area under those two curves is 40.43%. So if, if this process is stable and in control, and I can trust the measurements I'm taking from it. Those are all assumptions built into this kind of analysis. The defect rate this process is producing is about 40, 40.5%, 40 uh, probably much higher than my customer wants. In terms of process improvement, I can already see on the curve the problem is on the low end, not the high end, and that might imply different kinds of process improvement initiatives that I have to go on. So you're always interested both in the defect rate and where the defect is, uh, is just as important. The defect rate is a statistical calculation for this class. Um, what you would do about it is more a quality engineering challenge for a different class, but this data does get applied in many other classes in engineering.